In today's lecture, we're going to cover the evolution of populations. During the lecture, minimize your distractions by turning off any music, listening in a quiet space, and turning off your phone. Make sure you take plenty of notes for the lecture. Put the words on the slides as well as the overall audio in your own words. This will help maximize your learning. It may serve you best to make an outline before you even listen to the lecture. And this outline could include notes from the textbook as well as some of the written material that's already present on the slide. All right, let's get started. In this lesson, we are going to look at the process of evolution. It's prerequisite of genetic variation, two additional evolutionary forces, genetic drift and genetic flow, along with natural selection, that are the evolutionary forces that can act on a population. Finally, we're going to describe how evolution can be detected and measured using the Hardy-Weinberg equation. But first, let's dig into some background on evolution and genetics. By way of reminder, we've talked about DNA. There are four bases for DNA and RNA. DNA specifically has cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine. The backbone to DNA is a pentose sugar and a phosphate. So the nitrogenous base is inside the helix. For these complementary strands, only certain bases will line up and bond with other bases. These bondings occur based on the base pairing rules. A's always pair with T's, and G's always pair with C's. So adenine, a purine, only hydrogen bonds to thymine, which is a pyrimidine. And the same is true for cytosine, which is a pyrimidine, which will only hydrogen bond to guanine, which is a purine. Because of the double helix structure, and the structure of each of these bases, the purines cannot bind to themselves and the pyrimidines cannot bind to themselves. Biologists have concluded based on evidence that both A and T always base pair and C and G always base pair. We've talked about the double helix, but with all the genes that our cells contain, the double helix isn't small enough to fit in the nucleus of a cell. So, the double helix has to wrap around a core of proteins that are called histones. When the double helix wraps around the core of histones, this structure is known as the nucleosome. The nucleosome then folds up to make fibers of varying loops and widths. Eventually, the fibers are tightly coiled into the chromatid, one arm, of a chromosome. It is these chromosomes that store our DNA within the nucleus of a cell. Now that we've reviewed DNA, we need to explore one scientist's contribution to our understanding of genetics so that we can better understand evolution and genetics. Who is Gregor Mendel? He was an Austrian monk with a background in physics and mathematics. However, he is best known for his genetic experiments with pea plants. With these experiments, he discovered the basic principles of hereditary. His contributions have earned him the title of the father of genetics. Let's review some important vocabulary that will be essential for your knowledge of genetics. First, homozygous. Homozygous is an organism with two identical alleles for a character or trait. An organism that has two different alleles for a gene is said to be heterozygous for the gene that is controlling the character or the trait. Homozygous in organisms or individuals are considered to be true breeding. Heterozygous individuals or organisms are said to be not true breeding. Because of the effects of dominant and recessive alleles, an organism's traits do not always reveal its genetic composition. Because of this, we, we distinguish between an organism's phenotype or its physical appearance and its genotype, its genetic makeup. 
These days, scientists know how you inherit characteristics from your parents. They're able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait or getting a genetic disease according to the information they have from the parents and the family history. But how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century and a man named Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding the pea plants he was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. In one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow-seeded plant with a purebred green-seeded plant, and he got only yellow seeds. He called the yellow color trait the dominant one because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow-seeded hybrid plants self-fertilize, and in this second generation he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait. From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors, one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of a gene. Depending on which type of allele Mendel found in each seed, we can have what we call a homozygous P, where both alleles are identical, and what we call a heterozygous P, when the two alleles are different. This combination of alleles is known as genotype, and its result, being yellow or green, is called phenotype. To clearly visualize how alleles are distributed amongst descendants, we can use a diagram called the Punnett square. You just place the different alleles on both axes, and then you figure out the possible combinations. Let's look at Mendel's P's, for example. Let's write the dominant yellow allele as an uppercase Y, and the recessive green allele as a lowercase Y. The uppercase Y always overpowers his lowercase friend, so the only time you get green babies is if you have two lowercase Ys. In Mendel's first generation, the yellow homozygous P mom will give each P kid a yellow dominant allele, and the green homozygous P dad will give a green recessive allele, so all the P kids will be yellow heterozygous. Then, in the second generation, where the two heterozygous kids marry, their babies could have any of the three possible genotypes, showing the two possible phenotypes in a three-to-one proportion. But even peas have a lot of characteristics. For example, besides being yellow or green, peas may be round or wrinkled. So we could have all these possible combinations, round yellow peas, round green peas, wrinkled yellow peas, and wrinkled green peas. To calculate the proportions for each genotype and phenotype, we can use a Punnett square too. Of course, this will make it a little more complex. And lots of things are more complicated than peas, like, say, people. These days, scientists know a lot more about genetics and heredity, and there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited. But it all started with Mendel and his peas. Now that we've looked at DNA and Mendel, let's talk about genetic variation and how it's related to evolution and genetics. Selection acts on phenotypic variants. If the variance in a phenotype is the result of genetic variance, meaning that if the variance seen in a phenotype is the result of a change in the DNA at a given locus or loci, which is the DNA, the specific gene location seen in the DNA. Microevolution is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. There are three main causes or mechanisms that cause this allele frequency change, natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. Only natural selection consistently causes adaptive evolution. One common misconception is that organisms evolve during their lifetimes. Natural selection acts on individuals, but only populations evolve. As an example of an episode of selection and its result, consider the population of medium ground finches on the island of Daphne Major in the Galapagos, which have been intensely studied by Peter and Rosemary Grant for decades. Finches exhibit genetic variation in their depth of their bills. Some bills are more robust and others are less so. The offspring of the deeper billed parents tend to have deeper bills. Well, the offspring of the less deep bill parents tend to have less deep bills. There was a drought in 1977 that caused small soft seeds to become scarce. As a result of this, the finches mostly fed on large hard seeds. But those large hard seeds are hard for a finch without a deep bill. 
This applied selection to the population of finches, and selection often hurts. By the end of the drought, 85% of the medium ground finch population had died. Because the grants had been studying this population for so long, they knew a lot about this particular population of finches, including what the average beak depth was before the drought. After the drought, the average beak depth had increased by almost 10%. This is a truly stunning, amazing observation. It may interest you to know that in the years since the drought, the average beak depth for the finch population has gone back down close to what it was before the 1977 drought. This is because while deep beaks have a greater seed crushing ability, they are slightly energetically more expensive for a finch to produce and to live with. Strong selection resulted in a fast and dramatic change. Weak selection in the opposite direction resulted in a slow and less dramatic change. Evolution is change. Variations in phenotype often but not always reflect variations in genetics which is caused in individuals by changes in their DNA sequences. Differences in phenotype could be due to differences in environmental factors or influences of several genes. So some genetic variance does not generate phenotypic variance. In the example shown on the slide, the diet of the caterpillars has a dramatic effect on the phenotype. Here, it is important to note that the selection can act on this phenotype, and it can be very strong. But unless that selection is connected to an underlying genetic variation, there will be no evolution. Genetic variation can exist at the level of the whole gene or at the level of a nucleotide sequence. Much of the genetic variation at the level of the nucleotide sequence is silent, meaning it does not result in variance in phenotype. In part, this is a result of the fact that much of our genome and all organisms' genomes is non-coding. And to a lesser extent, it is a result of redundancy within the genetic code. Sources of genetic variation include mutations, gene duplications, deletions, and the re recombination of alleles. So again, when we're talking about evolution and genetics, the biggest sources of genetic variation include mutations, gene duplications, deletions, and the recombination of alleles. A remarkable example of gene duplication giving rise to a new function is seen in the visual system of two groups of primates. While most vertebrates have color vision, most mammals do not. Primates, in the order to which humans belong, provide an interesting example of what can happen when a gene is duplicated and one of the copies is free to evolve. Most mammals have two kinds of photoreceptors, one which is sensitive to violet light and one which is sensitive to the light between green and red. To see color, an organism needs at least three kinds of photoreceptors. Approximately 35 million years ago, an ancestor of ours experienced a gene duplication event, giving rise to two copies of the green-red photoreceptor protein. While these two copies were initially identical, they have since diverged, and as a result of mutation and selection, to the point that one has peak sensitivity to green light and the other has peak sensitivity to red light. As a result of this, we can see color. We've looked at evolution and genetics, discussing DNA, Gregor Mendel, and genetic variation. Next, we're gonna look at populations and organizations. A population, by way of reminder, is a localized group of individuals capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. Populations are not always isolated from one another geographically, but individuals typically breed with other members of their own population. 
When we consider populations, it's important to be able to organize them. We need to talk about a working definition of species. The most commonly used species concept is the biological species concept. It proposes that a species is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding organisms. Leopards can reproduce with other leopards, so they are in the same species. Leopards do not reproduce with bobcats, so they are of a different species. The method of naming a species we now use, binomial nomenclature, was developed by Carlos Linnaeus. The first part of the binomial name is the genus, and the second part is the species. By convention, the genus and species names are in Latin. When we write the binomial nomenclature name for an organism, the genus is always capitalized, and the species is always lowercase, and the binomial name is always italicized or underlined. Linnaeus' system consisted of sets that are nested into each other within a hierarchy. To examine the set, you can look on the screen to see the varying levels of organization for the leopard. You can see its species name, and then if we get a little broader, we can look at the genus, and even broader is the family, and even broader is the order, and then the class, and then the phylum, and then the kingdom, and then the domain. So if we go from the large scale down to the very specific, we would go domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. When we consider phylogeny as a way to organize the species and the populations, there exists a lot of data that needs to be considered. Phylogenies can be made up of morphological data, like Linnaeus, molecular data, as well as fossil records. The best hypothesized phylogenetic tree fits the most data from the morphological, molecular, and fossil. It's best to think of phylogenetic trees as a hypothesis. Phylogenetic hypotheses are modified when new evidence arises. Linnaeus's categories were based on shared characters. Organisms that shared most of their characters, like coyotes and wolves, were placed in different species, but within the same genus. This grouping was purely organizational. Linnaeus didn't understand the reason that coyotes and wolves were so alike and share a relatively recent common ancestor. After the publication of The Origin of Species, it became clear that what Linnaeus had done was developed family trees. Such family trees today are called phylogenies. Modern systematists are biologists who specialize in describing and naming species, and they're pretty adamant that classification schemes, the nesting of the species within the genus, should be based on evolutionary history, not simply on shared characters. But conventions change slowly, and there are still instances in which Linnaean classification and phylogeny do not completely agree. Let's look at an example of reading a phylogenetic tree. Any group, say a species, is a taxon in which the, each other's closest relatives are called sister taxa. The numbers on the phylogenetic tree represent the divergence points between two taxa. Looking at the figure of the slide, point number four represents the common ancestor of taxa B and taxon C. Point number three represents the split between taxon A and the common ancestor of B and C. Point number five is said to be an unresolved branch point from which more than two descendant groups emerge, but the evolutionary relationship is unclear. What information can we gain from phylogenetic trees? Phylogenetic trees show a pattern of descent, but phylogenetic trees do not show phenotypic similarity.
Phylogenetic trees do not generally indicate when a species evolved or how much change has occurred in a lineage. It should not be assumed that a taxon evolved from the taxon next to it. Phylogeny provides important information about similar, similar characteristics in closely related species. Phylogenetic trees are based on DNA sequences that can be used to infer species identity. For example, Steve Palumbi used a portable PCR lab to investigate whether or not the whale meat being sold at a market in Japan was from the species claimed. To do so, he bought samples of whale meat at the store, digested the tissue for extraction, extracted the DNA, and amplified a gene known to vary among the whale species to see if the meat was what the seller claimed it was. What he found was that sample 9 was very similar to samples from mink whales in a protected population and genetically different from that of the mink whales from the southern hemisphere. That is, sample number nine was in the same taxon as North, uh, North Atlantic mink whales. He also found that sample 1B was from humpback whales, and 10, 11, 12, and 13 were from a fin whale. What's important about exploring this is that both humpback and fin whales are protected as endangered species worldwide. We've looked at evolution and genetics, and we've reviewed DNA. Mendel, genetic variation, as well as populations and the organization of populations. Now we're going to look at evolutionary forces that can act on a population. First, we're going to discuss natural selection. Differential success in reproduction has the direct result of certain alleles being passed on to the next generation in greater proportions. For example, an allele that confers resistance to DDT increases in frequency after DDT was used widely in agriculture. Selection acts deterministically to drive deleterious alleles to extinction, while at the same time it's driving the favorable alleles to fixation. Natural selection increases the frequency of alleles that enhance survival and reproduction. How is the advantage or disadvantage of an individual bearing a given phenotype measured? Relative fitness. Relative fitness is the contribution of an individual and how they contribute to the gene pool of the next generation. This contribution to the gene pool is relative to the contribution of the other individuals within the population. Reproductive success is generally more subtle and depends on many factors. Sexual selection is natural selection for mating success. It can result in sexual dimorphism, marked differences between the sexes in secondary sexual characteristics. Selection indirectly favors certain genotypes by acting directly on phenotypes. When we think about natural selection, there are three modes, directional, disruptive, and stabilizing. Directional selection occurs when conditions favor individuals at one end of the phenotypic range. This is seen in figure A on the um, graphs on the screen. Directional selection in this example is favoring the darker furred mouse. It's favoring a mouse on one end of the phenotypic range. Disruptive selection is a condition which favors individuals at both extremes of the phenotypic range. This is in graph B. So disruptive selection would favor both the lighter mouse and the darker mouse, but not a mouse of medium darkness. Finally, in figure C is stabilizing selection. This is when conditions favor an intermediate variant, in this case the light brown mouse, and acts against extreme phenotypes. Adaptive evolution occurs as the proportion of individuals in a population have traits favorable 
for the particular environment. Because the environment can change, adaptive evolution is a continuous and dynamic process. Natural selection is one way of bringing about adaptive evolution. Genetic drift and genetic flow do not consistently lead to adaptive as evolution as they can increase or decrease the match between an organism and its environment. Now we're going to talk about genetic drift and genetic flow. Genetic drift is significant in small populations. It can cause allele frequencies to change at random. It can lead to a loss of genetic variation within populations, and it can cause harmful alleles to become fixed within a population. Genetic drift describes how allele frequencies fluctuate unpredictably from one generation to the next. If selection is deterministic, drift is chaotic. Genetic drift tends to reduce genetic variation through losses of alleles, and the effects are especially pronounced in small population. The smaller a sample, the more likely it is that chance alone will cause a deviation from the predicted result. Random genetic drift allows allele frequencies to change over time due to chance. The smaller a population is, the more susceptible it is to dramatic changes in allele frequencies due to genetic drift. In small populations, genetic drift favors a relatively rapid loss of alleles, leading to one allele becoming the only allele remaining for a particular gene. This is called fixation of the allele. Consider a hypothetical situation where a gene has two alleles, capital A and lowercase a. Each allele is present at the start at a frequency of 0.5. We will follow the frequency for the capital A allele. If the starting population is 20 and is sampled from by random mating to produce a new generation of 20 individuals, then dramatic changes in allele frequency are likely. For this sampling, as the process continues for future generations, the capital A allele is quickly lost, meaning that the lowercase a allele becomes fixed in the population. If the simulation is tried again with a new random sampling, dramatic changes in allele frequency will still occur. In this second simulation, the capital A allele becomes fixed in the population, meaning that the lowercase a allele is lost. Other simulations take different paths, but all lead to fixation of one allele or the other in a relatively short number of generations. In contrast, consider a starting population of 1,000 individuals. If the population is sampled from by random mating to produce a new generation of 1,000 individuals, and this process is allowed to continue for several generations, Genetic drift is still present, but is greatly reduced compared to what was seen with the smaller population. Even this larger population is not immune to ultimate fixation of an allele by genetic drift. However, in most cases, a very large number of generations will pass before fixation occurs. Random Now we're going to consider a specific case of genetic drift. This is known as the founder effect. Say a few birds get swept up by a storm and blown out to sea. They find an island and colonize it. These are the founders of this new population. Unless the allele frequencies for every single gene in this founder population are the same as they were in the parent population, then genetic drift will have affected a change in gene frequencies. The founder effect occurs when a few individuals become isolated from the larger population due to chance. There is another special case of genetic drift, the bottleneck effect. When genetic drift is very severe, for example, when a large population experiences some catastrophic event and only a handful of individuals survive, the effects of genetic drift can be very strong. Such events are called population bottlenecks. The African cheetah survived a severe genetic bottleneck approximately 12,000 years ago.
Though the number of cheetahs has recovered, the result of this bottleneck is that the entire species has less genetic diversity than a pair of non-identical twins in humans. The resulting gene pool is much less diverse than the original population's gene pool. If a population remains small, it may be further affected by genetic drift. So we've looked at evolution and genetics. We've walked through some reminders of DNA. We've briefly introduced Mendel and the ideas of allele frequencies. We've looked at genetic variation and populations and organizations. We've looked at evolutionary forces, natural selection, genetic drift. Now we're gonna look at gene flow. Gene flow consists of the movement of alleles among individuals. Alleles can be transferred through the movement of individuals or gametes, for example, pollen. Gene flow tends to reduce genetic variation among populations over time. Because of the reduced genetic variation, gene flow can decrease the fitness of a population. Here's an example. There's a bird known as the great tit on the Dutch island of Violand. Immigration of birds from the mainland introduces alleles that decrease fitness in the island populations. Natural selection reduces the frequency of these alleles in the eastern population where immigration from the mainland is low. In the central population, high immigration from the mainland overwhelms the effect of selection. Now that we've looked at natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow, we're going to look at how evolution involving both chance and sorting can be measured through Hardy-Weinberg. Hardy-Weinberg is an equation that describes the genetic makeup expected for a population that is not evolving. The principle is named after G.H. Hardy and Wilhelm Weinberg, who first demonstrated this principle mathematically. Hardy's paper was focused on debunking the then commonly held view that a dominant allele would automatically tend to increase in frequency. Today, confusion between dominance and selection is less common. Tests for Hardy-Weinberg genotype frequencies are used primarily to test population stratification and other forms of non-random mating. The Hardy-Weinberg theorem characterizes the distribution of genotype frequencies in a population that are not evolving. It's a fundamental model for population genetics. Hardy-Weinberg describes the genetic makeup expected for this population that's not evolving. If data observed for the population then differs from the expected value, then the population may be evolving. A population in which mating is random and none of the mechanisms of evolution are acting is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Here, allele and genotype frequencies remain constant from generation to generation. Mendelian inheritance preserves genetic variation in a population, and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium describes the constant frequency of alleles in such a gene pool. The Hardy-Weinberg equation describes a hypothetical population that is not evolving. In real populations, allele frequencies do change over time. There are five conditions for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and they are rarely met in nature. The first is that you have to have an extremely large population size in, in order to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. The second is that you have to have random mating or no sexual selection. The third, no new mutations. The fourth, no gene flow. And the fifth, no natural selection or adaptations. While in fact, most of these um, most of these points are not met in nature, Hardy-Weinberg gives us an important tool. 
if a system is not evolving, the allele frequencies will stay the same generation after generation. If we see that instead they're changing over time, then we know that the population is indeed evolving and we can measure this mathematically with Hardy-Weinberg. The Five Fingers of Evolution A thorough understanding of biology requires a thorough understanding of the process of evolution. Most people are familiar with the process of natural selection, however, this is just one of five processes that can result in evolution. Before we discuss all five of these processes, we should define evolution. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. But what is a gene pool? And, for that matter, what is a gene? Before spending any more time on genetics, let us begin with a story. Imagine that a boat capsizes and 10 survivors swim to shore on a deserted island. They are never rescued and they form a new population that exists for thousands of years. Strangely enough, five of the survivors have red hair. Red hair is created when a person inherits two copies of the red gene from their parents. If you only have one copy of the gene, you won't have red hair. To make this easier, we will assume that the five non-redheads are not carriers of the gene. The initial frequency of the red hair gene is therefore 50%, or 10 of 20 total genes. These genes are the gene pool. The 20 different genes are like cards in a deck that keep getting reshuffled with each new generation. Sex is simply a reshuffling of the genetic deck. The cards are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The deck remains the same, 50% red. The genes are reshuffled and passed to the next generation. The gene pool remains the same, 50% red. Even though the population may grow in size over time, the frequency should stay at about 50%. If this frequency ever varies, then evolution has occurred. Evolution is simply change in the gene pool over time. Think about it in terms of the cards. If the frequency of the cards in the deck ever changes, evolution has occurred. There are five processes that can cause the frequency to change. To remember these processes, we will use the fingers on your hand, starting from the little finger and moving to the thumb. The little finger should remind you that the population can shrink. If the population shrinks, then chance can take over. For example, if only four individuals survive an epidemic, then their genes will represent the new gene pool. The next finger is the ring finger. This finger should remind you of mating because a ring represents a couple. If individuals choose a mate based on their appearance or location, the frequency may change. If redheaded individuals only mate with redheaded individuals, they could eventually form a new population. If no one ever mates with redheaded individuals, these genes could decrease. The next finger is the middle finger. The M in the middle finger should remind you of the M in the word mutation. If a new gene is added through mutation, it can affect the frequency. Imagine a gene mutation creates a new color of hair. This would obviously change the frequency in the gene pool. The pointer finger should remind you of movement. If new individuals flow into an area or immigrate, the frequency will change. If individuals flow out of an area or emigrate, then the frequency will change. In science, we refer to this movement as gene flow. All four of the processes represented by our fingers can cause evolution. Small population size, non-random mating, mutations, and gene flow. However, none of them lead to adaptation. Natural selection is the only process that creates organisms better adapted to their local environment. I use the thumb to remember this process. Nature votes thumbs up for adaptations that will do well in their environment and thumbs down to adaptations that will do poorly. The genes for individuals that are not adapted for their environment will gradually be replaced by those that are better adapted. Red hair is an example of one of these adaptations. Red hair is an advantage in the northern climates because the fair skinned allowed ancestors to absorb more light and synthesize more vitamin D. Thumbs up. However, this was a disadvantage in the more southern climates where increased UV radiation led to cancer and decreased fertility. Thumbs down. Even the thumb itself is an adaptation form through the process of natural selection.
The evolution that we have described is referred to as microevolution because it refers to a small change. However, this form of evolution may eventually lead to macroevolution or speciation. Every organism on the planet shares ancestry with a single common ancestor. All living organisms on the planet are connected back in time through the process of evolution. Take a look at your own hand. It's an engineering masterpiece that was created by the five processes I just described over millions and millions of years. Can you recall the five main causes of evolution from memory? If you can't, hit rewind and watch that part again. But if you can, give yourself or your neighbor a big five-fingered high five. A gene pool consists of all the loci in a population. An allele for a particular locus is fixed if all the individuals in a population are homozygous for that same allele. The frequency of an allele in a population can be calculated. The Hardy-Weinberg equation in its simple reduced form is P plus Q equals one, where P is the dominant allele frequency and Q is the recessive allele frequency. By convention, if there are two alleles at a locus, P and Q are used to represent their frequencies. The frequency of all alleles in a population will add up to one. We can assume that the locus that causes PKU is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Given that PKU gene mutation rate is low, mate selection is random, natural selection can only act on rare homozygous individuals, the population is large, and migration has no effect. The Hardy-Weinberg equation, again, when we're talking about frequency, is P plus Q equals one where P is the dominant allele frequency and Q is the recessive allele frequency. The occurrence of PKU is one in 10,000 bursts. That is Q squared equals 0 0.0001 and thus Q equals 0 0.01. Since P plus Q equals one, the frequency of the normal allele is P equals one minus Q. In this case, for PKU, it's 0 0.99. The frequency of the carriers, the individuals which are heterozygotes, is two times P times Q. In this case, two times 0.99 times 0 0.01, which gives us a frequency of 0 0.0198 or approximately 2% of the U.S. population. In this lecture, we've talked about population evolution. We've talked about evolution genetics, evolutionary forces that can act on a population, and how evolution involves both chance and sorting, and how we can measure that through the Hardy-Weinberg equation. If you have any questions about this lecture, or the additional material in your textbook that supports this lecture, please reach out to your professor, either through email or visiting office hours. You can also bring your questions to class. And don't forget that there are learning assistants for this course who are more than willing to help you with this information.